The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Welcome to the Psalms with me, James Dellingpole. And this is the beginning of a, of a new series, which I've been promising for so long, and I'm really excited to be doing it, uh, embarking on my journey in the company of Nick Mackison. Welcome to Welcome to the Psalms, Nick. Oh, it's a real pleasure to be here, James. I'm delighted no, to I, I, Listen, I, I, I just wanted to say how excited I was to discover you, or, or kind of to be discovered by you, on, on I think, Twitter. And I, you were just one of those those voices which I, I found very sympathetic because you are a Christian. But mm-hmm. as, you, as you and I know, Christianity covers a multitude of sins. You, you've got uh, what I would call cultural Christians who mm-hmm. go to church at Easter and Christmas, maybe. Um, yeah. And I was, I was one of those as well. And, and it was more about the the outward form and 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 the tradition and i, I think those things are, are are important in their way but yeah. it's only in the last three years that i've really um discovered the essence of christianity and discovered that the part that i think has largely been excised from um our religion um which is the spiritual element the fact that mm. this stuff is real that there really is a battle going on yeah. between good and evil. And mm-hmm. it has been described in the Bible. I believe that the Bible is, is the most important um, handbook for where we are, how to live our lives. And I think you're probably with me on that one. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. I do believe it's the, the God breathed word. You know, so as men wrote it, God was inspiring it so the fact that it's written by human beings and inspired by god that's not a zero-sum game you know a lot of scholars like to play these facets off against one another um you know the human component and the, the divine nature of it but you know we can hold both intention uh, well not even intention they complement each other nicely so yeah 100 um, percent, james i'm you're still sounding quite faint i'm wondering whether maybe you should turn up your sound a bit Okay, how's that? Is that any better? Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think I think that's. I think we need to do that. So, okay. um, we're talking about the Psalms, which, which I, I I don't know about you. Uh, I think the Psalms are a microcosm of everything that is important in in the Bible, and mm-hmm. although obviously they're in the Old Testament, not the New Testament, I think they were validated um for, for 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 christians by the fact that jesus himself was well versed in the in the psalms he quoted them yeah. on on the cross even uh mm. and i think that if jesus thought the psalms were good and valuable then that's kind of an indication that they probably are pretty important yeah yeah i mean absolutely you know that the, the importance of the psalms is assumed in the new testament uh, Paul, as well as Jesus, says to the, the church in uh, Ephesus, you know, sing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So he's assuming the, the continuity of the psalms. And uh, the importance of the psalms, I think, is the fact that, you know, it's, it's quite interesting when you look at the Old Testament, the law of Moses. The law of Moses comes to us in five books called the Pentateuch, you know, Genesis, Exodus, through to Deuteronomy. And Moses outlines you know, the details of following God. He gives us God's law. But David, who's the author of most of the Psalms, uh, Jewish tradition has divided the Psalms into five books. If you notice that, there's book one finishing in book five. And, and Jewish tradition would say, as Moses gave us the five books of Torah, so David gave us the five books of Psalms. 
And so the point is, you know, if, if Moses tells us how to, to live the law, David teaches us how to rejoice in God's law and sing God's law. And you know, he teaches us how to worship, basically. Um, so, yeah, the Psalms are important. They do take the, the details of following God and, and express them. That's a big word. Doxologically, you know, they teach us how to sing and rejoice uh, in our walk with God. So what does, what does doxologically mean? Doxology means it, it, it's, you know, a word about glory. Uh, you know, to, to, it, it, it's singing the glory of God. It means to rejoice in who God is. Um, you know, it's it's turning what you know about God into praise and, and thanksgiving and, and song. Um, and that's what the Psalms are. You know, they, they're taking the, the details of the Mosaic law uh, and the lived experience of David as he tried to live out that law and all the difficulties that he faced. Uh, and he turns it into worship. Sometimes that worship is, you know, expressed in, in joy and, and, and singing. But it's not all happy clappiness, as, as, you know, you read through the Psalms again and again. There's often lament. You know, God help me, you know, I'm stuck in a pit. Or often, you know, there's an enemy after me. And I think this is this is where it plays into a, a lot of what you want to talk about, James, that the Psalms are about warfare. Almost every, maybe two out of every three, I would imagine, is about some form of conflict. And um, where, where the David or I mean the sons of Korah or Asaph or whoever the author is, they're crying out to God for help because they're being pursued by a mortal fool. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that I've I've chosen to launch this series with Psalm twenty three is well, I'm a great believer in learning the Psalms. Mm. And I think that if you are going to learn the Psalms, the first Psalm you should learn is psalm 23 because it's short apart from anything else so so it's 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 not too daunting a task mm. uh it's also i think i i call it the master psalm just because it's it's the it's 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 the sort of shortest and punchiest and saint augustine i don't know whether you know uh, called it the martyrs psalm right. he he advocated it as the psalm that martyrs should should recite as they were being martyred, mm. I suppose. I suppose if, they, if their deaths being quite quite quick, you want it. You want you want a short. You want a short. Well, sure. Well, uh, you don't want to go through a Psalm one one nine, do you? You know that uh, that would. You don't want to uh, prolong it. Yeah, but, Psalm one one nine. Do you know what? I, I, this is the thing. I um that in medieval times, when you when you were a novice monk your first job was to learn the Psalter. Wow. And I was thinking, yeah, I'd like to learn the Psalter, but the one I'm really dreading is Psalm 119, which is the longest Psalm, because it's, 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 like, it's like lots of, lots of Psalms joined together. It's also yeah. possibly the most boring Psalm. Maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a former Presbyterian minister, you know, and it goes on and on about how, how brilliant God's law is. So, you know, I, I, that was real rust from my, my mill you know I, I loved Psalm 119 um, but you know I can understand why it would be you know to somebody who's not as familiar with it I, I can understand why it would look a wee bit repetitive you know it seems to say the same thing over and over again yeah um, yeah 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 um I'm, thank you for for mentioning the fact that you were you were a Presbyterian minister because people are going to be wondering why am I talking to this guy Nick Magson um so you were a, pre a Presbyterian Presbyterian minister and now mm. you are studying the New I'm Testament. Studying, yeah, I'm studying New Testament. I'm in the final year of my, my PhD. Um, but yeah, I was uh, for 13 years, I was a maths teacher. And then I experienced something of a, a miraculous call into a different way of life. Um, it was, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a kind of happy, clappy mystical Christian in any way, but it was really quite a, quite a stunning experience of, of God's drawing me into uh, Christian ministry. And then, uh, so I went, I left that in 2015 and I went to seminary um, and while I studied in seminary, I was helping um, as an assistant minister in a church plant. Now, church plant just means a new church that has been started uh, and this was a church plant in one of the, the roughest parts of Glasgow, Govan, in the, in the south side. And uh, quite a remarkable guy, Norman Mackay, 
had gone into Govan and basically started a church by walking up and down the street, talking to people and seeing if he could make contacts and then starting Bible studies. And from there, things seemed to snowball and he planted a church. So I, I was fortunate enough to be along, you know, come along for the ride. I was a friend of Norman's and, uh, you know, so I ended up, uh, you know, assisting him. And from there, um, after I finished my studies, I, I, I did a short time of full-time ministry and then I was uh, asked to, to do some further study by one of my former lecturers and they paid me to do it, so what's not to like? So but, here I um... am. I, I want to hear a bit more about your time in 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 Govan. Um, but mm. first of all, your your PhD obviously isn't in the New Testament. What? what tell me what esoteric angle you've chosen. Oh well, yeah. At the risk of losing the entire audience, um, I'm looking at how the New Testament interprets the verse in Leviticus eighteen five, which says, "The man who does these things will live by them." And now that's Moses talking about the law um, and, and the Old Testament. And, and Paul quotes that text in Romans 10 and in Galatians 3 um, he say, to speak about obedience to the law. The one who does the law will live by the law. And he critiques that, um, the way that the, the, the Jewish people have read that. Um, and I've got I've got another angle on how uh, traditional interpretation of that verse is, is, is going. So I'm not going to, I don't want to bore anyone, but yeah, it's um, what it should help is to, you know, it teaches us how to read the Bible, like Jesus did and the apostles. That that's that's what I'm trying to trying to do because I think a lot of our our reading has been influenced by, you know, kind of Enlightenment categories, um, authorial meaning or or historical context. These things tend to dominate the the interpretive landscape, and we, you know, we we we, we major on these things and we minor on the fact that this is a, a divinely inspired word as well, which is capable of a. Uh, uh, you know uh, what what is called a fecundity of meaning. Um, so you know what the the author, the original author, may have had in mind could also you know it could be superseded by a divine intention as well. So there's a yeah that's that's what I'm that's what I'm going to be that's what I'm looking at. Sorry about if that was a word. Isn't salad. it amazing? I, I was thinking three years ago, I couldn't have imagined anything duller than. <laughs> doing the sort of thing you're doing and now yeah. i think well what a fantastic what a fantastic calling it to get to know the to examine the bible in depth yeah. i mean in your case to <laughs> to examine one sentence from the bible oh, it, it's yeah i'm basically becoming an expert in a tiny tiny field you know as uh, what the CRPHD is about you know it's about knowing more and more about less and less um but at the same time, you know, there's a, the other angle is you don't take it too seriously. It's an extended bit of homework, and at the end of the day, nobody's going to read it. What it does, it's equipping me for a, a life of hopefully scholarly endeavour and teaching others. You know, so it's it's a it's a formative experience more than it is something that people will actually what, take up and read. Were you always um, a Christian? No. Um, I I grew up in a Christian home, but um, I, it was quite a maybe a dysfunctional home by you know normal standards, whatever that is. Um, my mum was really a committed Christian. She was quite a quite a mystic in in many ways. She would do lots of evangelism. Um, she was actually one of these. She was a kind of cringe god botherer, you know. A, you know, people would have thought of her in that way as, as um, but yeah, so she she was a, a very committed Christian. My dad as well, he, he struggled as you know, he, he he's a believer but he had he had his own struggles. But when I was very young, um I think it must have been about when I was about four years old perhaps, my mum was diagnosed with cancer. Um and you know, she just had the, her third child and um I mean, you know, the cancer's another rabbit hole to go down. But the doctors had basically said, when I, I think it was about four or five, that she had three months to live. And so, you know, she was quite um, little in her reading of the Bible. She went to James 5 and says, if anyone is sick, let him call the elders of the church 
to anoint the sick with oil in the name of the Lord and the sick will be made well. So she gets in touch with the elders and said, I've been given three months to live. Um, come and anoint me with oil, please, and pray for me to be made well. So I don't think the elders had ever done anything like this before. It's quite a conservative little church, you know, not into the kind of, you know, the more charismatic um, expressions of Christianity. So they came over to the house and I, I was only told this story you know, a few years ago. One of the elders prayed over her and, and I believe under the influence of the Spirit said, give her seven more years so that she can see her sons grow up. And um, it was seven years pretty much from that point that she passed away. So she died when I was 13. So it must have been when I was six that she'd gotten the, the diagnosis. Um, and it was, yeah, I mean, she, and she left a real legacy. I mean, one of her friends spoke to me a few years ago as well, and she said, you know, your mum, she said, I used to find her quite overpowering in terms of, she was always talking about, oh, I shared the gospel with somebody today, and, they, you know, they prayed the prayer and they've become a Christian. And this friend of hers was saying, uh, every week when we spoke about these things, your mum would say, oh, somebody else became a Christian and somebody else became a Christian. And she says, I, I got a wee bit cynical after a while. I thought, she is she is just talking garbage here. You know, she I mean nobody can convert that amount of people. Which is a you know, long story short, after my mum had died, she met every single person that my mum had mentioned to her in prior conversations, scores of people, all of whom would say to her, you know, I became a Christian as a result of Eve Mackison's influence on my life. So and she she was quite a quite a remarkable woman in that respect. I, I was brought up in that environment, you know, with her um her guidance and whatnot. But losing her at thirteen obviously was a bit of a, a hammer blow for a, a young guy and for my younger brothers. Um we went to school in quite a rough part of Glasgow as well. So, you know, adopting the whole turn the other cheek ethic wasn't exactly an appealing prospect at that point, you know. Um I was, you know, it was uh, two types of people in that school, the quick and the dead, and I wasn't very quick. So I, I was, uh, yeah, I was not a Christian until I, about the age of 18, where um, one night when I would normally have been out drinking with my mates, I, I stayed in and read a, a book that somebody had given me. And, yeah, the rest is history. I, I thought, I saw my peril, so that I was in trouble, so that I, you know, I couldn't kind of coast off my parents. Christian profession that um, I was walking on a path towards destruction. You know, Jesus says that broad is the the way and easy is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on it. I realised that I was on a road to destruction, um, and that I was living off the faith of my parents. and And it was at that point I I just gave in to the hound of heaven, and as C.S. Lewis calls him, I prayed the prayers like God save me. I'm terrified to tell my pals that I've become a Bible basher, but save me, God, and Incredibly, at that point, the Holy Spirit I'd, it, it came upon me almost viscerally. And for the first time in years, uh, I wept. Um, you know, I'd always been quite a hard little guy who couldn't cry at anything, and I was just full of tears. And, you know, I had this sense that whenever I prayed, there was this huge ear just listening to everything that I was saying. So it was, yeah, I had a, it was a remarkable conversion experience for me as a young man. That's Sorry. amazing. That's amazing. So w when you say you were a hard man, what, you were getting involved in fights? Were you doing drugs well, or drink? No, I, I wasn't a hard man at all, James. I was in a hard area. I was in a, I was in a hard school. Um, I mean, my house, I was. I, I, lived, I lived in what they called a bot house. You know, um, I had, my dad had, was a working class man come good. You know, we had our own sandstone detached house and stuff. So by Glasgow standards, we were doing quite well. But we still had this kind of working class ethic. I was sent to the school in the housing scheme. There was lots of uh, there was lots of fighting going on, and you know, I, I was I was a, I was a scared, frightened man. You know, a frightened wee boy. So I, I got into a lot of fights, but I would, I would never have described myself as a hard man. Um, if I could run away from something, I would. But I, I liked to drink. I experimented with drugs. Um, yeah, and that that all stopped after uh, at a young age, at eighteen, really. So, um, I, I, Glasgow is famous for it, its rival football teams, 
Rangers mm. and, and Celtic. And there's a big mm -hmm. sectarian divide, a famous sectarian divide in Glasgow yeah. between Protestants and, 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 and Catholics. But mm. I'm, I'm presuming that means that generally Glasgow is in one way or another quite, quite Christian relative to the rest of the country. Uh, you would think it would be. I mean, in the Catholic schools, there's certainly a degree of morality and, and some kind of ethical standard to which the pupils are pointed. But the the other schools, we don't call them Protestant schools. They're just called non-denominational schools. And, you know, aside from the odd visit from the, the local Church of Scotland minister for a school assembly, there's little to nothing of religious instruction in the vast majority of Glasgow schools. Uh, so it, it's like you'd said at the start, if there's any form of Christianity predominating in Glasgow, it tends to be a cultural one. But people have very little knowledge of you know, the contents of Scripture or that you know that the, the nature of God, who he is and who Jesus is. Um, I would say it's pretty much as secular as anybody else you'll see in the, the United Kingdom. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, pro probably the, the, the fact that there's a strong heritage of Protestantism and Catholicism, um, it tends to be more cultural yeah. than, it, than anything else. So yeah, people haven't got a clue, generally. In my experience, I mean, we were the church that in Govan, that's right in the shadow of Ibrook Stadium. You know, Rangers, who are the traditional team of the, the loyalists or the Protestants, but quite remarkably, all around Ibrox and, and Govan, it's a large Irish Catholic community. So most of the people around there are Celtic fans and, you know, it tends to be also Catholic. So lots of the folk in Govan Free Church um, were former Catholics um, who had turned away from Catholicism because, now I don't want to slag off Catholicism in any way, but it was just the Catholicism that they'd encountered. Uh, they were saying to me, we didn't hear about Jesus or what anything about God from the priest? You know, we we've never even opened a Bible, and uh, and that's not to bash the Catholics because I think it's pretty much the same thing in the, a lot of the Protestant churches too. In the Church of Scotland, you know, you'll never open a Bible. It's the, the gospel according to the BBC. You know, so you'll hear more about Ukraine and climate change, I would imagine, than you would about the Lord of Hosts. Um, yeah, well, th I think this is another area where you and I might be in agreement that. <laughs> if you were if you were the devil um and your enemy was christianity which it is what would you do you would you would so arrange it that the the honest faith of christianity became politicized um became sectarian so that it wasn't about christianity it wasn't about christ's message it was about just just petty differences, squabbles Absolutely. over. And that's yeah. happened, hasn't it? No, it, it definitely has. Um, the government has, it, it seems it has its, peop its tentacles everywhere, even in our, our church buildings, and it has its op operatives everywhere. So, you know, if, if you're in a church, and, you know, the, the, the major note that you're hearing about on, on the Lord's Day morning on a Sunday is the dangers of climate change, or how evil Vladimir Putin is, or, you know, um, we need to be, uh, you know, using hand sanitizer all over the place and you know, all, all that stuff. If that's the major key in your church, then it's not a church. And, you know, your, 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 uh, your minister is actually a minister of the state and not a, an emissary of, of God and Christ. So, yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs. But I think also, you know, James, you have on the other side, you know, these are the obvious very, I, I suppose, progressive uh, faces of, of a, a warped Christianity, but you see it in, in, in the, the, for want of a better expression, the right community, you know, so you've got somebody like a Jordan Peterson um, lecturing through the Bible. You know, I, I went to hear one of his lectures in Glasgow, and he was speaking about you know, Cain and Abel, um, and there's nothing there about the nature of God. There's nothing there about Christ. It, it becomes a simply a moral tale for, for the betterment of your life, and you know to help you tidy your damn room. You know that that's 
the the Bible seems to be a means to an end of a good that is not, you know, the beatific vision of God and Christ. And if that, if you don't have that, then chuck the Bible out. You know, it, it, it's what's the point of it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is one of the things that, um, on my search for the for the the true meaning of of, of Christianity. I've tried to um, escape all the excrescences which have which have sort of coated Christianity like a kind of rust or a sort of fungus o- over time, and and hidden the, the 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 truth underneath. And I've tried to strip away all the stuff that's the accretions of time um, yeah. and politics. And find out what is the core of the message, and it seems to me mm. that the Psalms are one of the things that that really do that. Um, yeah. And because because well, the, the point I made at the beginning about Jesus quoting them, uh, mm. but also they seem to be like the distilled essence of of of, of the of the teaching of the, of of the Old Testament. They're like they're like the kind of greatest hits of the old testament condensed in 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 something which is also <laughs> happens to be beautiful beautiful poetry so mm. let, let's have a look at at, at at psalm 23 one of the things that yeah. that strikes me when you look at the psalms is how the perspective changes in within a psalm so it starts off sort of almost impersonal third person the lord is my shepherd i shall not want but Mm. then later on it's it's about thou Mm. Uh, suddenly one is addressing the well the speaker of the psalm presumably david suddenly Mm. addresses addresses god by that intimate word thou Mm. um and it becomes suddenly very, very personal. It, this happens yeah. quite a lot in the Psalms. Do you know anything about why that is? I, I think it's possibly a poetic device. I mean, I'm a New Testament guy, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so there might be some Old Testament guys out there listening and you know shouting at their, their screens. But I, I think it's more of a, a poetic uh, literary device in order to draw you into the, the drama of the moment. Um, but I think you do make a good point there, James, about that. You know the progression, because there is a there, there is that progression there. There's that kind of you know third person. The Lord is my shepherd. You have the the sheep out in the field, um, out, or out in the plains looking for pasture. But then it seems to progress through along the right path and into the dark valley of the shadow of death, and then it ends up with the the, the David himself sitting in the house of the Lord having a, having a feast. You know, he's, he's, he's gone on this pilgrimage and it seems to map out and, and, and rhyme with our experience. Life is often out in the, the wilderness and the only way that we are going to reach refreshment, the only way that we are going to reach that state of restoration of the soul, as, as the text talk about, is through the valley of the shadow of death and the other side of that will be sitting in the presence of the king. Um, and, but the glory of the psalm is that through all these stations of our lives, you are, thou art with me. You, you said it there, that intimacy there. Um, that's that's actually the the, the centre, the literary crux of the psalm, because in the Hebrew there's 26 lines above, um, thou art with me, and there's 26 lines below it. And, and so often the authors you know, use these literary devices to cause you to focus on a certain verse, uh, and the whole message of the psalm here is, thou art with me. And all the changing scenes of life, uh, and whatever I'm experiencing, God's covenant presence is, is fatherly care, it is, it, it is with me. So we might want to talk a bit more about that in detail later That's, on, but it's just, a, as, a, just as an overview. That, I'm so glad that you're familiar with the, the Hebrew... With the, were, was it, were the original psalms, the original language was Hebrew, yeah? Yeah, it was written in Hebrew, yeah. Well, mo- most of the Old Testament was Hebrew, apart from parts of Daniel, which were written in Aramaic. But yeah, most of it was Hebrew. Um, and Hebrew dating from different centuries, so there's a... That's why it's such so difficult to read the biblical Hebrew, because you read parts of the narrative, you could read through the Pentateuch, Genesis through to Deuteronomy, and you think you've cracked it. 
But then you come to the Sams, which is a, written in a different style and, and probably in a different era too. That you know, it can be the difference between Elizabethan English and and modern, you know, Cockney, if you like. Um, you know, you, you can run into real difficulties and you feel completely de-skilled again. Is there a um... I'm presuming the answer is yes. Is is there a, a dimension in the Hebrew version which is missing from the from the translation? That I, I mean, the, the translation I used there was the the King James mm. version, which was yeah. we know was done by a committee um, mm-hmm. published in what was it 1611? I think 1611. Yeah, 1611. Yeah. Um, there are there are other versions. I I mean the the Book of Common Prayer, which is still just hanging on, clinging on by its fingernails as the, as the the Church of England's. Um, I've got that here. That's the one for a Scot. I shouldn't have one, but I do. It's very. I love it. I mean, I I, I actually prefer. I, I I when I started learning the Psalms, I um I just assumed that the King James version would be the best because I'd heard of the King James version; it was old and I, and, and sonorous and stuff. But actually, generally, I prefer the, the well. They're about a hundred years earlier. The the the, the translation by um, Coverdale, Miles mm. Coverdale, who 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 translated all the Psalms. His translations are used in the Book of Common Prayer, um, mm-hmm. and a lot of his translations. The 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 the, the, K, the KJV translators borrowed heavily on from from Coverdale, but there's not much yeah. in it. I mean, I, I I like the version I've 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 quoted. Um, uh, anyway, the, what... King James is, the King James is excellent um, because I, I mean I, I I'm, I'm still I'm probably beginning slash intermediate level in Hebrew, and uh, if I ever come across a tricky passage, I, I don't understand the word order in the Hebrew. I'm you know I'm thinking what is that trying to say? You know I look at a variety of translations to help me. And nine times out of ten, uh, the King James Version will have not only managed to preserve the word order in an amazing way and make sense of the word order in English, but also do it with a poetic and literary flair. It is is utterly remarkable uh, as an achievement. Uh, And and so when when you're reading it, actually, you can be quite assured that it, it is mirroring the structure of the underlying language pretty closely. I would say so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty outstanding, in my opinion. You, you know, the longer I've been trying to read through these original languages, the more impressed I've become with the, the authorised or the King James Version, as it's more commonly known. But uh, you see, you, you've just introduced me to a dim- dimension that I, I wasn't familiar with, that, that thou art with me is the oh. centre of the psalm. Oh. And yeah. it's surrounded by that that really chilling moment. I mean... I think most people uh, who have even, even a passing familiarity with the scriptures will be aware of, of that, that concept of the valley of the shadow of death. Um, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And I, in, in the period before... I became really interested in the Psalms. I got little hints of, of their significance. Um, just a, a brief, brief bit of autobiography. Um, I, I went to a traditional English prep school uh, mm-hmm. where we went to, um, we went to chapel seven days a week and wow. twice, twice on Sundays. And, we would always we, we would sing hymns but there would always be a psalm as well mm. and as a a nine-year-old boy i really could not see the point at all of these dirgy i mean they were like dirges they, they they didn't have jaunty tunes like like the hymns and and they had this this old language which didn't make much sense to me as a as a child but of course later on in life you, you realise that the, the, these words have been imprinted on you, so that so that even now when I when I when I say some of the psalms in my head, for example, the God is God is our hope and strength, Psalm forty six, I I um I, I remember how it was sung because after all, psalms are designed to be sung, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that they are meant to be sung. 
that's one of the things the Presbyterians do quite well and they've managed to put the, the Psalms to metre and, and sing through them. Um, so, you know, the, the denomination I was a part of, they, they would sing through at least two Psalms for every service. Uh, some congregations sang Psalms exclusively um, rather than any of the, the, the modern um, worship songs. And I, I do think you get you miss a lot if you're not singing the Psalms regularly. Um, it's, it's what you know. You had Doug Wilson on recently, and he was talking about that. You know, the, the Psalms are just replete with uh, the warfare motif, and there's virtually zero modern hymns that have that. You know, that trope. Um, they tend to be about ha- having a, a smashing time with Jesus, and yeah, isn't Jesus and, great? Jesus is my boyfriend, and you know, it's all this stuff. And the problem is, it, it, I, I think that. We don't have psalms about warfare because we, you know, the people that write mod sort of songs about warfare, because modern hymn writers haven't suffered. You know, so David was able to write his psalms because he was a great man that had suffered greatly, and it's only if you're to become a great man, you know, you suffer greatly. We saw that he'd been pursued by Saul uh, through the through the wilderness. He was hiding in caves. His own son turned against him turned the whole country in a military coup against them, and he was again on the run. So, so David had a few hard times of which to write, and, and, and these a lot of these psalms are forged in the times of David's most extreme suffering. Um, yes. Like James. No, I, I, th- this is... <sighs> I, I worry, uh, well, I think it's inevitable, that we are... We are heading towards times as as dark as any that human beings have have lived through mm-hmm. and i think increasingly the message of the psalms is going to be more and more relevant to us mm. i mean it, we know that in times of, of 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 well we've mentioned martyrdom but also in times of war for example during the civil war i mm. know I know that the the parliamentarians certainly sang the psalms, and I I, I expect the uh, the the royalist forces did too, because they were much more god for it. But but you can just imagine you you'd need the solace of the psalms as you were marching towards death or dismemberment. Absolutely, um, and I, I think that's what's particularly powerful about this psalm. I mean, if we look at the the flow of it. If, if you mind me talking through Please, the first yeah. couple of verses, yeah, you know, so, so so David has started it off quite quite in a remarkable way. He says, "The Lord is my shepherd." Now, um, David, at the time of this writing, he's the king of Israel. Um, he's probably the, the the superpower in the Middle East. He was a badass. His armies had crushed the Philistines. You know, he had a harem of wives. You know, he was the he was at the peak of his powers. Uh, and often um, military rulers or, or gods in the ancient Near Eastern context were, were called shepherds of their people. And you'd have images depicting the gods holding a rod and a staff or a, a mattock and a crook. Um, these were the, 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 the kind of symbols of royal office. So you've got David, you know, the most powerful man in the known world at the time. And he's saying, before the presence of the Lord, I, I am just this sheep. Um, I am this vulnerable um, creature who needs brought to safe pasture, who's prone to straying. You know, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it, it talks about sheep as uh, animals that are prone to straying. You know, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the, the iniquity of his also. So sheep are prone to, to straying. And, and David is basically confessing, I've got all this power. I've got all this, this regal authority. I've got this massive army. But before the presence of the Lord, I'm nothing. I'm just like this vulnerable sheep who's hungry, who's thirsty, who needs his soul refreshed. All I can offer God for all my, my military pop, all I can offer him is my, my dependence and my neediness. And that's what it, you know, it's, it's the first thing that the Psalm is teaching us. You know, we don't offer God our achievements. He's not impressed by them. You know, there's no such thing as being too good for God and there's no such thing as being too bad for him either. The psalm is saying God wants our dependence, and and that's the, that's the beginning of the the, the shepherd sheep relationship. But David is talking here about 
well, what does a sheep do? The sheep looks for green pastures. The sheep needs the quiet waters. Uh, the sheep needs refreshment because uh, back in those days, the you know it's very seasonal weather, and the the, the the shepherd would often have to take the, the sheep out into the wilderness to find pasture. Um, he, he would be searching around in, in these kind of places for 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 green pasture and for water, and this would leave them exposed because they're out in an open an open area. So they don't just need provision, but they need protection. And David's confessing that for all my riches and for all my military authority, I still trust in the Lord ultimately for my provision and my protection. Uh, you know, without Him, um, I lack everything, but with Him, I lack nothing. And I think something that, as you talked about the original languages, do you see things in the original text that you wouldn't get in the English? And I think one of the features of verse 2 and 3 is that when he says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, these are imperfect verbs in the Hebrew. Now, an, inher- an imperfect verb could express frequent behaviour or habit. So, f- for instance, verse 2 could be saying, The Lord's my shepherd. He often makes me lie down in green pastures. You know, he regularly leads me side, beside the quiet waters. So, so there could be that that notion of uh, regularity. I, I think that does chain with our experience. Um, often, you know, we feel dry, we feel washed out, and we feel that life is having a, you know, having its way with us. And all of a sudden, God, you know, brings something into our life that that, that Jesus up that, that that refreshes us. But um, instead of a habitual reading, it could also mean a future reference. So the sheep here could be saying, he will make me lie down in green pastures and he will lead me beside the quiet waters and he will restore my soul. The picture here could be the sheep is starving, the sheep is thirsty and the sheep is exhausted, but he's still trusting in the shepherd. You know, so he's following the shepherd. The shepherd hasn't come up with the goods. You know, life, life's crap at the moment, you know, but he's saying the Lord is my shepherd and I'll lack nothing. And, and I think this is important for us, James, because often as Christians or followers of God, we feel that um, when things go wrong in our lives, you know, let's say, you know, you, you try to follow God and your finances go to pot, you know, your skin. I mean, you, you launched out pretty much in faith after you went down the rabbit hole um, and it was a costly thing for you, you know. Um, and it can be tempting to think when I follow God and things go wrong that I'm doing something wrong. You know, I'm not doing this Christian thing right because it says, oh, you know, I thought you had an abundant life if you were a Christian or whatever. But David's saying here, the Lord is my shepherd. And in this life, I'm, I'm, I'm starving and I'm, I'm thirsty and I'm exhausted. But I trust in him that for the future, he's going to provide for and meet all of these needs. And I think as you go to the book of Revelation, that, that future sense is brought out in Revelation 7, where you know there's a, a, a vision of the throne room of heaven, and Jesus is standing there, and he's described as the lamb, the sacrificial lamb who was slain for our sins. And it says, the lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them beside the flowing waters. And so, the reader of Re- the writer of Revelation has obviously read into the future tenses of these verbs and said, "Well, this is something that Jesus is going to do for us in the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. He's going to provide for us for our, for, you know, our wants, our needs. He's going to refresh us at that point." So, I think. Sorry for that that extended monologue, James, but that, I think it's it's uh, you know we're talking about life can be arid and difficult, and then you look for a solution, and then the next place is you know you're in the middle of a dark valley in verse four. Um, so the psalm should disabuse us of any notion that following God is a, a life of, you know, let's say poops and giggles, just to keep it uh, parentally friendly. Uh, it's not. It's going to be hard, and if it's hard, it's not because you're doing it wrong. It's probably because you're authentically following after the shepherd. Um, and I think that is that's an encouragement. Um, you know, just because you. Your marriage isn't going well, just because you're skin, just because you're struggling with you know anxiety, mental health issues, etc. Does that mean that you're you're, you're doing it wrong? Have, have you taken your eye off the ball? Well, not necessarily. Um, these that sense of dissatisfaction and, and and spiritual thirst and hunger and exhaustion it can be a 
an authentic mark of somebody who's following their shepherd. Yes, no, well, thank you. for. Uh, <laughs> you shouldn't apologise for your, for your extended monologue. That was exactly, <laughs> exactly what I was, I was hoping for. Um, just on that, the, the pastoral theme, um, I think particularly for a, a, an English audience, but I, I mean, yes, a, a, a British audience, really, the wool trade has been very important to our national prosperity. I, I, I live surrounded by, by sheep, and I think, uh, and I, I love eating. <laughs> I love the fat of the lamb. <laughs> oh, um, me too. Uh, it's, it, uh, I mean, Americans don't, don't seem to eat as much, as much lamb as, as, as we do, but, but in this country, um, England, um, it's, it's key. And I think that I'm an English literature um, graduate and there's a very strong theme in English literature, the pastoral. We think about it, 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 it evokes calm and beauty and a sort of a sort of prelapsarian state of, of, of bliss. I think that may be maybe part of the appeal of that psalm to later generations. Sometimes I think it gets a bit twee and cloying. I don't know whether you, you're familiar with the the version of of Psalm 23, which is sung to a tune called Crimmond. Uh, yeah. And I find it warbly and, and, and rather ghastly. Just yeah. Saccharin. Yeah. I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, singing Metallica lyrics to a girl's allowed tune. You know, it's that type of thing. The, the, the two things tend to clash a wee bit and you miss out on, Something of the gravitas, yeah, and the pastoral richness that the the words should evoke. Um, yeah, the tune should get away, get in the way of the lyrics, basically, should it? You, you, you've nailed it. I mean, it is, it is getting close to Jesus is my girlfriend kind of, kind oh. of Christianity, which I think, oh. I think, did infect quite a lot of late nineteenth century and certainly twentieth century. Christian songwriting. It was. Uh, I mean, mm. I, I. I think the devil has the best tunes. They say, but I think he also wrote some of the worst tunes for the church between eighteen eighty and 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 nineteen eighty. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, there's there's a there's a frapping video by Luther and Satire where it has a it's a, it's a cartoon of Cliff, not not Cliff, right yeah. Which is the Clint Eastwood reading modern Christian hymn lyrics, and it's it's hilarious. You know, he said these these uh, these Christ these hymn lyrics sound like um, my daughter married her Barbie to her care bear and, and wrote the wedding vows. You know, that's what the, a lot of the, the 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 lyrics sound like. And you know, you know, in a place like Govan, if you're going to ask these you know battle hardened men to start singing about you know. Uh, how, how how beautiful Jesus is, and you know what a great boyfriend he'll be. It's uh, you know you're not you're not really going to sell that, you know. Um, the same, but it's not just it's not just hard men. It's just regular men. They don't want to sing homoerotic songs to God. Um, it's it seems to go against the grain. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm I have been. I mean, looking at the psalm itself as well. You know that that the, the, the 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 content there, and you, you know, you're talking about how you know difficult times could be ahead of us. Um, you know, and, uh, with all your guests uh, and listening through it, you know, there, there can be a temptation, I think, um, to hear about you know the cabal or the regime, and you know, uh, Klaus Schwab and all these these guys, and there, there can be a, a temptation to to despair. Um, I know I've felt that temptation myself, but the Psalms tell us, you know, fret not yourself when the evil man prospers or when his plans succeed. Um, the Psalms are there basically to say, right, okay, these, these guys these guys may look as if they're in charge, um, but all of a sudden they're going to be gone like snow off a dike. And you're going to be asking, you're looking around and asking, what was the problem the whole time? You know, and you're and talking about, about Psalm 37, aren't you? Yeah, 
Yeah, I love that. A... I love that. I, I, I'm looking forward to learning Psalm 37. It's quite a longy, but there's that yeah. bit, isn't there, towards the end where it talks about, find it for me. Go on. Yeah, I'll find it for you. Yep. I love uh... that. I love that bit. Yeah, let's see. Um, okay, yeah. Is, is that, so wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Um, there is... Then it goes on to say, Mark the perfect man and behold the upright. The end of that man is peace, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Um, yeah, it's the bay tree. That... Yeah. It, I it's, love uh, that. I love that it's line. It's beautiful, isn't it? That, that, that's a thing about the Psalms. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's this idea of the wicked being everywhere, the psalmist being surrounded. But all of a sudden you move from that context and it's something completely different but where they're gone they've, they've just all of a sudden disappeared yeah um and, and it can be a bit disorientating you know because the psalms at one moment it's going oh i'm surrounded god help me and then the next moment it's like yeah man i'm in the house of the lord looking at the beauty of the lord it's all good yeah forever so yeah forever um so therefore i will not fear uh, if an army besiege me um and there's that idea of the the, the fragility of the wicked man, even though they look like they're in the ascendancy, even though that they appear to be winning, that's the facade. You know, that's the illusion. Uh, the wicked man being in, in control. It's actually Sam too. It's the son, the royal son, who sits on the throne. Um, Jesus himself, who who laughs at the wicked. So it, it's uh, he's the one who's in control, and it says his wrath can flare up any moment. You know, so the end of the wicked. It will, it will happen in an instant, according to the Psalms, and we'll be looking around. Not we'll be saying, oh, "Where's Clive Schwab going?" You know, where, where, yeah. remember that guy stroking his cat, or you know, where, what happened to the the Western political regime? This uh, they've gone. You know, and what a glorious day that's going to be, James. When there's no such thing as the Tory Party left. You know, um, subverting politics or. or there's no such. We won't even need them. We'll have a based monarchy, a, a theocracy. Um, you know, God wins. He's already won. So, you know, that, that's the that's that's one of the glorious things about these psalms that instills that in us. Because if we don't believe that God has already won and that God wins, you know, it, 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 we should despair. You know. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm I'm totally with you. If it were not. Excuse. Yeah. Sorry, my dog. So, yeah. Uh, Nick, you're copying sorry, me. That, that, that often my dog interrupts podcasts, um, oh, and I, there's no sorry, shame in I, that. I can only apologise. So, <laughs> it's interesting what you say there because it's why I think that it is so important to learn the Psalms, um, mm. so that they become part of your of your being. Because, yeah, to, I've I've heard it said that that the Psalms are the Christian equivalent of, of spells. They're like incantations. Mm. They have, they have a magical power, uh, mm -hmm. more powerful than, than, than magic. Um, mm. and through repetition, especially if you, if you speak them out loud, they mm. go out into the ether and, and somehow change the nature of, they go out into the world and and um there is neither speech nor language but their word is heard among them um psalm 19 yeah nice <laughs> well done well spotted <laughs> yeah your, your memory work the psalms has been brilliant man like, really well i do you know i i i the, the more i do it the more i love it every day i when i go for my runs my morning run with the dog i recite the psalms in my head and I'll, I'll tell you a story about that in a moment which uh, i know will strike a chord because you you're familiar with the podcast i'm about to cite but my first inkling of, of the, the psalms have have power um a few years ago i did this series of interviews i was obsessed with world war ii at the time and i did a series of interviews with world war ii veterans 
the, a number of whom were still around at the time. I mean, they're quite, they're really quite old now. And one of the chaps I befriended was this lovely man called David Hearsey. Uh, and he won a, a DFC flying, I think he flew certainly 30 missions, may have, may have even have been 50, flying Halifax bombers from uh, a an airfield i think it may have been in 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 lincolnshire it was somewhere it was somewhere very bleak and 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 flat and he told me the story about what it was like being a bomber pilot and it was really they used to call themselves bus drivers because that's what they were doing they were simply flying on a, on a course that w w was provided for them in in that that day's or night's briefing well then they'd normally fly by night the americans f flew day missions the raf tended to fly night missions and you'd be given the coordinates of where you were supposed to drop your bombs um and the time that you had to deliver your your payload on on target and yeah. beyond that it was very much up to you as the as as the, the as the captain of, of of the pilots of the bomber you could decide pretty much how you got there uh and and what what the rules were on your particular bomber yeah. and so for example david would not allow drinking or smoking on his flights and um a, a few other things he did for example he when he was when when he, he went over enemy territory he would he would fly in a really erratic fashion so oh. he would sort of be flying level and then suddenly he would he would he would drop like this and and then drop again like that sort of like is it called barrel rolling i i forget the the, the term but anyway um he said it was very unpleasant to be on a plane when you're doing this very unpleasant for his crew but he said the reason i did this is because if there's a german fighter looking for a target it's going to be much more attracted to a, a bomber which is flying even um than it is for one doing these crazy these crazy maneuvers and it must have worked because after all he lived to tell the tale he lived many years after um and I said, well, it must have been terrifying. Um, how did you, how did you cope? Because, I mean, the, it took a very long time to get from Lincolnshire or whatever to these targets in Germany, heavily guarded by ACAC, um, uh, which the, the worst thing that could happen to you would be being coned, which is where all the ACAC, all the anti-aircraft um, pinpoints you and, 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 and you get coned, which means you're in the, in the, at, the, at, the, at the point of the pyramid, as it were. And that's there's no it, way out. you're gone. Yeah. No, there's, there's no way out. And, and you, you know, you could hear the sort of the screams of, of, your, of your comrades as, they, as they, they came down. He said, and it was even what, I, I, he said that the, the fighter pilots had it relatively easy because they were fighting, particularly in the early, early stages of the war, they were defending British territory. So if they got shot down in a dogfight, they would parachute down into, well, if they were unlucky, into the channel, but if they were lucky, into, uh, uh, into the green fields of Kent. Um, oh. If you were on a bombing raid, the likelihood was when you got shot down, you were probably or quite likely going to be well he, he he said sort of spiked in the arse by a pitchfork but actually i think that was a euphemism for being lynched oh, my. lynched by angry mobs who were understandably yeah. furious at having had their their homes torched and their and their their families killed by by bombers so it was a very yeah. ugly um unglamorous business i said how did yeah. you get through it so there's this a long long way to reach this he said, um, the 23rd Psalm. Well, and when he told me that, I thought, well, yeah, of course, that was a Christian generation. But actually, with hindsight, I realize that it was more than that. That yeah. I believe 
that the Second World War was not as it was sold to us. What it really was was a blood sacrifice. Mm. Um, and, and that one of the things it did was give a massive feast to the demons that, that stalk the earth. They feed on, they feed on fear. They feed on, on, on terror. Mm-hmm. And what he was doing, little did he know it, was that he was, by reciting the 23rd Psalm, he was warding off the demons that were, were feeding on his, his terror and his crew's terror. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would agree with that, James. It's, it, it, there's no... It's little surprise because you see Jesus doing that himself and, you know, he's in the wilderness and Satan's there whispering into his ear, I'll give you this if you bow down and worship me or why don't you turn the stones into bread? Um, and, and Jesus comes back and it is written it is written, it is written. He speaks out the word of God to the devil and the devil flees from him in the end and, you know, and, and angels are ministering to him. And I think that similarly with the Psalms, these are God's word. You know, you speak out God's word. God, God's word comes with force. It's, it has creative agency, but it's also described as the sword of the spirit in Ephesians 6. It's, um, you know, and that's, you know, explicitly in the context of spiritual war against you know the powers, the principalities. Speaking out the word of God, it, it, it's a it's a slicing um, weapon when dealing with an immaterial foe. And there's yeah, it, there's very little in that, that that surprises me. I would I would um, I think there's something powerful in speaking it out rather than just you know meditating on the words in your head. Um, but I mean, even even that, if you think about that, James, you know, as, as you were speaking about, you know, the pilot there. And in verse four, I was looking at this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now this is, you know, the psalm. It, it's kind of gotten dark all of a sudden because he's, you know, the, the sheep is, you know, he's been in, he's, he's hungry, he's thirsty, and he's exhausted, um, and he's looking for restoration. But he's going to walk along the righteous path. So verse 3 says, you lead me along paths of righteousness for your name's sake, for your own honour. So, you know, he's following his shepherd um, diligently and faithfully. And and where that's led him is the dark valley, the valley of the shadow of death. Following the shepherd has brought him into danger. And, and you you know, again, I keep speaking about disabusing us of of false notions about the Christian life. Following the Lord is going to bring you into conflict. You know, you've signed up for um, service in the struggle against the unseen powers. Now, in the Old Testament, when you read through the Psalms, that the enemies of God are are, are are mortal enemies. You know, it's the the Philistines, the Moabites, the Ammonites. You know, they all surrounded that little strip of Israel, wanting to invade the country, you know, knock down the temple, and impose their own pagan. Uh, religion upon the Israelite people but as we move to the New Testament there's a, there's a change in register or, 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 or note whereby the veil is lifted we're no longer trying to preserve a physical strip of land in Israel, we're no longer fighting against these mortal foes we're seeing the hidden malevolent hand uh, as we move to the New Testament and it's the powers, the principalities the, the, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places so as we sing these psalms, as we read through them, we are waging war against these unseen malevolent forces that are opposed to us. And when we follow God, we are going to be brought into this cosmic conflict, which will often lead us into the dark valley, the valley of the shadow of death. And if, if, you're, fear, you know, if you're facing a fearful situation just now, if you're, you, know, you are in fear of your life, you might be tempted to ask, where's God in all this? You know, I remember Chief Wiggum when uh, he arrests Sa- uh, Flanders for drink driving. You know, he's like, where's your Messiah now, Flanders? You know, there's, a, there's that kind of, you, you feel the world laughing at you. Everything's going tits up uh, and you're meant to be following God. Well, the, the Sam writer saying here, the shepherd doesn't just take you through dry places. He takes you to dangerous places. And you need not fear. It says, because thou art with me, the centre of the psalm. God promises us Himself. That that's that's the great glory of 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 the the message of the Bible that we get brought into a, a communion, us little 
frail, sinful creatures with the, the immortal, the infinite, the eternal one. Um, he cares for us. And so it says here, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He says, I'm not scared because the shepherd's got a rod and a staff. Now, interestingly there, the rod, it's like a matic, it was a wee short weapon with a big club in the end. And, and the shepherd would use that as a weapon to fend off predators or thieves. Um, you could kill a bear with it. David himself speak, spoke about in First Samuel, I think it's chapter 17, he was given a shepherd's CV to, to Saul and he said, you know, I've been a shepherd my whole life. It says, when a bear or a lion attacked the flock I, and, and took off one of my sheep, I would run after it and I would take the sheep out of its mouth. And when it turned on me, I would grab it by the hair and strike it and kill it. Now, the weapon that you would use to kill bears and lions was, was the, the matic, the rod. And uh, the shepherd had that, that it's a little cosh type thing. He had that on him at all times. He would, uh, as the sheep were sleeping, he would be there kind of half dozing, holding this weapon, ready to strike anybody that comes near his people. And so, uh, sorry, come near the sheep. And, and that's the disposition God has towards us. He's like, he's, he's waiting over us with his rod in his hand. And the interesting thing is the, the word for rod there that is used in Psalm 2.9, where the sun will smash the nations with a rod of iron. He, you know, he's, he's sitting on the throne with his rod, the shepherd's rod, and he's looking at the enemies of his people, and he's just waiting for his time, where he uses that rod by which he protects us to smash the evil. So we should be filled with confidence. Um, you know, we should be filled with confidence because our shepherd is strong and he's, he's a violent shepherd who won't put up with this crap forever, you know, that we're, we're facing. He will use his power and his arm to, to you know, bring about a, a definitive victory. But, but I think I think this is what is the real comfort of the psalm. Like, when you come to know God, you have this shepherd. When you're asleep, he's, he's, he's waiting over you jealously, uh, guarding you, um, ready to fend off evil. I mean, who wouldn't want that? I, I was what did you ever see the the uh the south park episode where with, with jesus no i've seen a couple of them oh it's fantastic uh, what, the, the the south park jesus is really cool um and there's a great moment where he says i'm packing and he 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 opens his robes to reveal that he's got he's got all these these um machine guns underneath he's right. and and actually as so often, South Park is is completely on on the money, because yeah. you and I know um, that that part of the war on Christianity in the last yeah. well, it's been it's been it's been ongoing since since the time of Christ, but mm. recently all the all the kind of the tough elements of jesus have have, have been removed we've we've been oh, encouraged man, yeah. to forget the fact that he is he's also angry and and vengeful and that that god is a jealous jealous god and yeah. it, it, because because we're so keen to pretend that it's all about my feelings and 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 nice and fluffy and there's that other element i i, I didn't know about the what, what, what's the what's the tool called a matic you say a, a matic in Matthew. the Hebrew, it, it, it's um, Shavet is the Hebrew word, Shavet. So he has, it's, it's basically a, a short weapon um, by which he will, uh, you know, uh, fend right. off the, the, the enemies there's of his a, people. The, um, the, the, the line after that, that I, James, I love, where, where it goes, Thou preparest okay. the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And I love mm -hmm. the image of... In the presence of mine enemies. So there he is. He's surrounded. The, the enemy is plain in view. And he is being treated to this lavish feast. It's almost like God is trolling the, the, the enemy. He is like, trolling. No. Well, well, Sam 2 is laughing at them. And Sam 23 is trolling them. Um, and the, the, It's right what you say there, James, that, that, that kind of Jesus has been, I say this reverently, but you know, there's a, an emasculated image of Jesus, um, you know, whereby we absolutize the record of the gospel. You know, so the, the one who suffered and died and bled on the cross. But the problem with that is that, that, that 
while that is a, a significant note in the scriptural witness, you know, Jesus did die for our sins. Uh, it was necessary for him to lay down his life um, in order that we might be forgiven. We we forget the other side of things that the, the, the cross, while he was crucified in weakness, it was also, I think Hugh Martin, the old Scottish preacher, called it, the cross was his chariot of glory by which he rode through the heavens and subdued the powers and the principalities. And there is this note of Jesus as conqueror, an uh, uh, exalted king, um, ruling monarch who, who crushes his enemies. So, you know, Revelation chapter 14, you see, when Jesus returns, you know, he treads the wine, pr- the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Jesus is coming back to do some business. And, and, and you know, it talks about uh, the, the, the blood of his victims, you know, when Jesus comes back and, and uh, you know, wages war. It says, you know, the blood rose to a horse's bridle for something like seven miles, right? So Jesus is Jesus isn't just kicking ass. Jesus is is, is murdering and, and and slaughtering his enemies, and uh, you know, we forget that Jesus 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 is a scary lord. You know, and I mean, we we read the text like uh, you know Matthew eleven twenty eight, where he, Jesus says, "Come to me, all ye that are." weary and burdened and heavy laden and I will give you rest because I'm gentle and I'm lowly of heart. So this gentle and lowly Jesus it is a true picture of Jesus but it's an incomplete one. Yeah. You know, um if you if you know it's like if you can't handle Jesus at Revelation fourteen, you don't deserve him at Matthew eleven twenty eight. You know, it's that yeah. it's that type of thing. He's uh, you get the whole Christ. Um it, it, you know it's like when they were speaking about Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia. Is he safe? You know, no, he's he's never safe. Um, but also, is he tame? No, he's not tame, but he, but he's safe. Is that yeah? You know, is that kind of thing? He, following untamed Messiah, he's, he's he's scary at points, and um, but that's that that fearfulness he's going to bring to bear for the the the, the, the vindication of his people. Um, and well, that's, it's, that's it's... what I love about the. Kiss the sun, lest you be angry, and so you perish from the right way. If his wrath yeah. be kindled, yea, but a little, blessed are the, mm. all they that put their trust in him. That's that's not a that's not a pussy pussy Jesus. It is, I think it's so prominent, particularly in the Old Testament, but it's still in the New as well. It was so prominent in the Old, this exalted, ruling, strong monarch that that's why the the disciples of Jesus they couldn't get their heads around the the fact that he had to die. That's a, Wait, you know, but you're the Messiah. You know, you're here to kind of kick out the Romans. You're here to put, you know, Emperor Schwab or whatever he is in a headlock and and you know cause us to reign. But Jesus says no. The path to the path to conquering is the path of suffering. And this is a, a, a Christian theme. Martin Luther was pretty strong in it that that the path to glory always comes via the cross um, I think you see that here in the psalm you know David doesn't get to sit in the house of the Lord and have a nice slap up meal with him without going through the dark valley first it, it's similar for us you know that the path to glory is the way of the cross it's the way of suffering it's, it's quite interesting I think in Mark chapter 10 when Jesus to disciples James and John they get their mum to stick in a word for them with the boss and they said, you know, you know, the mum, you know, like a, a kind of middle class uh, aspirational woman goes up to, to, to Jesus and said, let my son sit beside you, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And, and Jesus says, you haven't got a clue what you're asking. Um, you know, this isn't for me to give anyway, it's for my father, etc. But to sit in my right and on my left, that, that's not for me to grant. But it, it involves a way of suffering. He says, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Well, interestingly, at the end of the Gospel, end of Mark, we do see somebody at the right hand and another person at the left hand of Jesus. It's, it's the two insurrectionists, the two thieves, if you like, crucified either side of them. You know, so Jesus is saying, if you want to reign at my right hand and at my left hand, you have to learn to suffer at my right and my left hand first. Um, and the Psalms reminding us of that. You know, we, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death on our way to the house of the Lord to, to that slap up meal. Um, so it's not going to be a bed of roses, and and, and the payoff is always future for us. Um, and it's not like a crypto investment, you know. 
crypto. I, I, I've invested a few things, and you always get some YouTube influencer saying, "Oh, next bull run, it's going to kick off. You know, it's going to blow off top. It's going to be great yeah. to the moon." Well, it seems, yeah, it's going to moon the moon boys. B O I, you know. Uh, well, everyone I touch seems to turn to crap, you know, and then you know miss miss their bull runs. But you know, this isn't like this isn't selling you a crypto scam. This is saying you know, there is a there is a future, there is a future bull run, there is a future blow off top, uh, and it's going to involve you sitting in the house of the Lord with a head anointed with oil and your cup running over. It, basically, you're part of the household of God. You've been invited into His family, and that I think is what the image. It is getting across. And interestingly, James, in verse 6, um, Sam writer says, Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Um, we know from other passages in Scripture that, that the shepherd follows the sheep. He doesn't walk ahead of them. You know, the sheep, the sheep go ahead of the shepherd. And uh, it looks like the sheep are calling the shots um, and that the shepherd is just, you know, basically... It, Doing kind of retrospective damage control. Um, it says that in, in First Samuel, I think it's chapter seven, where God speaks to David. Verse eight says, "I took you from following the sheep." I t- you know that was that was the kind of metaphor for being a shepherd. You know, a guy who just walks after a bunch of stupid sheep. Um, so there's this image that the shepherd is behind us. We seem to be running out of control, but he's in control the whole way, actually, and actually behind us. Goodness and mercy are following us. In the original Hebrew, again, the word for follow means to pursue. It's used when an enemy is in battle and he's hunting down his foe. Um, he's basically saying the Lord's loving kindness and his mercy, that is going to hunt you down. It's not going to miss you. You know, you might feel that your life is taking a wrong turn. You might feel it's chaotic. David said, don't worry, man. Goodness and mercy are hunting you down if you belong to the shepherd. He's always behind you. And he's always going to overtake you with it. Um, for me, that's a great comfort. Um, that's interesting. It's it's the exact opposite of the Eumenides, the Furies, the kindly ones that pursue the in 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 Greek in Greek myth. The, I don't know about that. Uh, the, yeah, well, so so there are the Furies, which 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 chase you and tear you to pieces when they catch up with you. They're, 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 as, as your kind of punishment for, for, for your sins and they're oh, called wow. the Eumenides which means the kindly ones it's a kind of euphemism to try and buy them off with a, with a nice friendly word <laughs> even though they are the Furies um, oh. but here you've got the anti-Furies the, these these mm. goodness and mercy which are kind mm. of chasing you remorselessly because that's the inevitable deal of 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 trusting in the Lord yeah yeah it's a uh, and I think it's really it's really encouraging, isn't it? Because, I mean, we're going to make a lot of mistakes in our Christian life. We're going to screw up. Um, we're going to let God down with, you know, our own sins. Um, but also we're going to make some unwise choices as well. And, and it's good to know that, that you know, that withstanding, um, our, our incompetence notwithstanding, it's God's goodness and mercy that triumph in the end. It's, it's quite interesting, verse 3, you know, the paths of righteousness. Uh, some some texts say the right paths. And I, I think some people interpret that to mean that God will lead me to right decisions all the time. Um, you'll help me to, you know, help me not to make a blunder and career choice or marriage partner choice or, or whatever. But the text isn't saying that. It, it's saying paths of, of righteousness, that, that's paths of right living. Uh, paths of living in conformity to God's covenant demands, um, because that's a that's a theme throughout the Psalms. You know that, that the the life of of faith and trust in the sovereign Lord is is like a, a journey. You know, so from birth to death, you're on a path. You're either on the way of the righteous, Psalm one, or you're on the the pathway of the wicked, which leads to destruction. Language that Jesus Himself takes up, and so. The Psalms are basically saying if you want to be safe in glory, you need to walk the path of righteousness. Um, and this can cause a lot of fear because I think, that, you know, for Protestants to think, well, does that is that works righteousness? You know, am I earning my way to heaven by being a good boy or, or girl? Um, 
but that, that that's not what the, the, the text is talking about. Um, often, particularly the old Puritan ministers, they would say that when you believe in God or believe in Christ, God gives you the right to eternal life. So it's like a, a deed. He says here, you, you have the right to eternal life. But you have to go about cashing that deed. You have to go and, and do something with it. So um, the attainment of life is, is gotten through walking the path of righteousness and walking in the path of holiness. So, so the right to life is given to us when we trust in, in Christ. But the possession of eternal life is gotten through walking the path of, of righteousness and holiness. And I think language like that can be quite discouraging because we can think, well, my life's a bit of a, a shambles. You know, I still struggle as a Christian. I, 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 you know, too many sins to count. How am I going to walk the path of righteousness to glory? And, and, and David is saying here that it doesn't depend on you. He's going to lead you on the righteous paths. He is going to school you in godly living for his name's sake. His reputation depends on it. So that fear of could I ever live that Christian life or you know, could I keep it up? It's not, a, it's not a biblical fear. It's saying when you are looking at the shepherd and when you're trusting in the shepherd, leave the results with him. It's all up to him. Um, you might screw up regularly. Um, but he'll help you live and walk a righteous path in the midst of your terrible decision making. Let's just say. So yes. I find that encouraging too. As a as a bit of a, I can be a bit of a clown sometimes. Um, my wife knows that as well. I mean, she said last thing she said to me before the episode was, "Don't say anything stupid. Um, like don't don't uh, slag anyone off. Don't slag any other." denomination you know don't say it basically will make you unemployable in the future um and i was thinking to myself yeah and she said because i've listened to dell and paul she said as well and he's just as bad as you she was saying to me so i'm like okay um, the two of you will it could be a, a dangerous combination so I, I think um so far we've managed to keep it fairly we've been very good nick we've been i, I think so I, I think the shepherd will be pleased um with our restraint um <laughs> i think so before we go, we've got to talk about the the Jerry Marzinski podcast oh, because wow. or yes. the two of them because I mentioned my early Amazing. sort of brush with the psalm with the with the power of the psalm was mm. David David Hearsey, the 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 RF bomber pilot, but mm. then more recently I did a podcast two podcasts with Jerry Marzinski. And it's it's been one of my most popular podcasts. It's it's resonated with a lot of people. I mean, I to be to give them credit, I I I discovered him on the Sheep Farm podcast first. They got there first, but anyway, Jerry Marzinski, as you know, is an Arizona psychotherapist, um, psychiatrist, psychotherapist, who had great success working in U.S. prisons and high security mental hospitals treating the people who'd been classified as paranoid schizophrenics, the kind of people who hear voices in their heads. And, I mean, people who haven't heard the podcast should listen to them, but Jerry intuited um, that these, these voices, which conventional medical wisdom has it are are kind of auditory hallucinations they're just invented by deranged people are in fact not not hallucinations at all they're real and that they yeah. are manif they are demonic entities mm -hmm. and um marzinski discovered that the most effective of all the methods were well, certainly for for, for 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 patients from a kind of christian background uh, was if they recited the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm literally wow. warded off the demons. Now, I, I think that, that was quite an eye-opener for a lot of listeners. It certainly was for me. But you were saying to me that in your experience in Glasgow, you'd, you'd witness this kind of thing yourself. Yeah. Um, I have, yes. Um, you know, you, you see particularly in... Uh, areas where there's, you know, large, you know, drug taking um, cultures. I, I think that uh, you you alluded to there, James, the, the kind of scientism of a lot of people. They would say, "Oh, these voices are you know, auditory 
hallucinations, etc. Um, and they suspect that because they are auditory hallucinations, they cannot also at the same time be something else. Uh, I, I, see, I, I'm of the opinion that you can have both a medical and a spiritual explanation for something. For something, you know, they, they don't have to be mutually exclusive categories. Um, and so, when somebody takes drugs, you might say, "Well, some kind of chemical, biological process is occurring in the brain, and that's why they're seeing various things or conversing with various entities." It's all. But they assume that because that, that is the case, because there is a scientific side to it, that the, the spiritual side is, you know, an illusion. But I'm saying that uh, that scientific experiment, that scientific um, process, is actually the gateway into another dimension. And so, you know, I had one one of my my friends in the church. He said that a couple of times when he was on heroin. He, he saw the devil and spoke to him face to face, and um, you know people would say to him, "Oh, well, that was just you having a bad, you know, experience of the, the smack." Um, but he was like, "No, it, it was more than that. There was something, you know, visceral about it." Um, so I, I do believe that drugs can be um, a gateway to the supernatural. I mean, and in, in Greek, the Greek for sorcery is pharmakos. Um, and you know, so it seems to allude to the fact that back in the you know ancient times, people would take certain substances to encounter the the, the spiritual world. So, yeah, yeah, I found that when we were ministering in, in, in contexts like that, you would often encounter something very dark, you know, with people who were using. And I think also it explains the pull and the slavery of addiction in a way because it's not just a kind of a it's not just a, a, a chemical biological process that's that's going on in somebody's mind. There's a there's a spiritual slavery going on there. Um so uh, yeah, a lot of the time I think people who are trying to recover from addiction need some form of exorcism, um some form of renouncing of, of the devil and all his works. But in terms of uh, Sam's, I mean I have a friend who was called to exercise a house um, and, you know, there'd been stuff going on in the house. The kids, had, particularly with the, the, the children of this family, there was a lot of, um, really, all of a sudden, really quite rebellious behaviour, terrible language coming out of their mouths. And, um, you know, the parents were like, what is happening? Why, why? The kids have just changed overnight. I mean, there's something demonic and dark about it. So they asked this minister, bloke, and, my friend went up to the house and he walked around the rooms praying the Psalms, you know, being the 23rd Psalm, whatever else. And he says he came into a certain room and as he was reading the Psalm, his attention became arrested on a, an object on, I think it was a mantelpiece. And he said, what's that? And the householder said, well, I bought that my travels. Uh, I think it had come from Africa or something. He was like, get that out of your house. Um, and he believed that the reading of the Psalms had kind of led him to this object, and so so that they got rid of the object, they smashed it up and threw it away. Overnight, the children went back to normal. No more rebellious behaviour, no more filthy talk coming from them. It was like the next day, and they were on the phone to the the minister saying, "This is this is incredible." But at the same time, at the same time, the minister went on the worst and darkest depression of his life. He was off work for months after that. And he, he thinks that some kind of transaction had happened in the the spiritual realm whereby what was in the house had fastened on him for an extended period and it took him a long time to to kind of divest himself of that, that darkness which hung over him. Um but yeah, yeah so but he, and for him it was a it was a text of scripture. He turned on the radio one day I happened to have a broadcast from a church service, and as the minister wrote, read from this passage, I can't remember what it was, it was coming through the radio, my friend said, suddenly the darkness lifted from him on the hearing of a verse of scripture. And uh, he went back to work the next day. So, I mean, absolutely um, bizarre stuff, terrifying stuff. But I think, James, the, the, the important thing to remember is that 
spiritual conflict is, is can be scary. Um, you know, Peter says in First Peter five eighteen, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So be sober and be vigilant. It's important that we don't give way to fear. You know, interestingly, Peter doesn't say there's this malevolent spiritual entity prowling around like a, a roaring lion. So be afraid. Be very afraid. He says, be sober and be vigilant. It says the same in the Psalms. You know, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but I'm not scared. Um, over and again, the command is, don't give way to fear. Fear not. Um, and it's important to to bring that on because we are people who are prone to fear. You know, our sinful natures make us um, susceptible to giving way to anxiety. I think we need to also qualify that by by noting that when the Bible tells us do not fear or fear not or be courageous, it's not commanding you to just magically turn off the pounding heart or the, the churning stomach or the shaking limbs or the sweaty hands. It says, even though you're feeling sensations of fear, don't let these sensations determine how you act. Don't act on fear. Don't make a decision on the basis of fear. Uh, and, and this is difficult for us because fear is kind of hardwired into us for, for good reasons. You know, we, we fear putting our hand in the fire or, you know, we fear getting bollock naked and walking down the street because we know that the consequences are going to be, you know, fear can be a, a help to us in, ma in many situations. But in the spiritual conflict, fear is our enemy and we mustn't listen to its directives. Um, there's an interesting passage 1 Corinthians 2, where the Apostle Paul says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling to preach the gospel in Corinth. And I think what's notable there is, there's the Apostle, you know, the, the, the godliest man that ever lived after Christ, um, you know, that wrote, wrote most of the New Testament. And he says, I was terrified. I, I was shaken. I, I was trembling that I was so, you know, I was so afraid. But that didn't determine what he would or wouldn't do. He says, I came to you in weakness and fear. He says, I had weakness and fear, but I still came, you know. And I think that um, the fear knots are there to remind us that though you have these sensations, though your stomach's churning, your knees are knocking, and you feel almost sick with anxiety, it's saying, don't listen to that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a wee story that I heard on this, James, if you don't mind. So, again, an extended hmm. monologue here, but uh, this was told to me by Nori McCann, old minister, and it's a good one. It's about fear and how we react. There's a story about lions. So that when when an elderly male lion gets too old to, to you know fight and protect the pride and whatnot, um, he needs to make himself useful in some kind of a way. You know, the lionesses won't tolerate you know um, passengers. Um, I know how he feels. I, I was thinking that myself. as I was speaking, I, I felt, uh, yeah, this decrepit lion who's of no use. So basically what the elderly lion does is he lies on you know, a particular place in the, the African plain and he roars in the direction of the prey. He roars at the wildebeest. And, uh, the wildebeest hear this roaring noise coming at them from this direction. And they're... they're Fight, flight response kicks in. The, the the instinct tells them to run in the opposite direction. So that's what they do. The ro the roar is coming from there. So I'm going to go there. You know. So they run in the opposite direction. But as they run in the opposite direction, they, they encounter an ambush of hungry lionesses who tear them, you know, limb from limb, and have a good old feast, and then bring some of the spoils back to the, the decrepit old lion that they can hunt. Uh, and the the, 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 kind of, the moral of the story is that had the wildebeest run towards the roar, they would have been safe because that lion was too old to, to get up and, and chase after them. It was too weak. It was riddled with arthritis. If they'd run towards the roar, they would have been safe. And I think often Satan roars at us because he wants us to go in the opposite direction. He wants us to run away from the thing that is causing us the greatest anxiety. You know, the thing that we're thinking maybe of a risky venture of, of serving God in a certain way or, or, or doing a certain thing or having an encounter with a, a certain individual or whatever. Satan roars at you to run in the opposite direction. But when he does that, actually, this is, that is his backhanded way. That's God's providential way of saying, you need to go in that direction. You need to run towards the roar. 
because he's a toothless old lion. All he can do is roar. He's been defenestrated by Christ. You know, he's riddled with arthritis now. He serves the interests of the sun and the throne. So when he roars in a particular direction, when he tells you to go the opposite way, you run right towards that. And though it may be terrifying, you'll, you'll never be truly in danger at the heart of God's will. Um, so that was a... Nick, that's helped me. Nick, I am so, so glad. Because I, I know you you were reluctant about doing this this podcast because you thought, well, you know, what, I've never done this before. And like, you, you were absolutely brilliant. Oh, and thank you, James. It's a really. I, I I hope the sound works because it would be a disaster if um it, it, you were and and actually by the way not untypical of of I do find that um dark forces do tend to sabotage my podcast particularly when they are to do with the demonic or to do yeah. with 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 Christianity it's just that they don't like this stuff getting out. But I really appreciate your 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 knowledge and experience and 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 thank you for. If it hadn't been for you, Nick, I, this this Psalm twenty three podcast would have been, um, you know, on the back burner forever. Because I, I needed somebody to give birth to the to help me help me give birth to my Psalm series, and and yeah. and you've done it. So uh, thank you. It's it's an honour to be here at the inception of, of your Psalm series. But I also want to say to you, James, just by way of encouragement, I believe God's hand is on you in a powerful way, and. Uh, all, all of these things that you experience, especially your episodes on Christianity, which seem to be fraught with sound difficulties, technical problems. Man, you, you, you've stirred up a hornet's nest in the, in the, the spirit realm, I think. And I, I feel like guys like you, um, you, you shame the religious establishment. You know, somebody from the religious establishment, um, I'm looking at God doing a new thing with his He's using certain individuals, you know, from outside the traditional boundaries yeah. to get his word out there. I mean, you're, you're bolder about Jesus than a lot of ministers I know. And it's the same with Alistair Williams, you know, a comedian. Yeah, Alistair, um, Alistair is something Alistair, else. He is unbelievable. His boldness, he's not refined. He's not a theological training. He's not been through 70. He's getting the word of Christ out there amongst, you know, uh, dissident communities, if you like, in a way that the church never could. Um, Nick Dixon as well now, so it, it, it is really exciting to see, and it's humbling. Uh, God is saying, right, all you guys have had training. I'm not going to use you. You know, I'm going to use this journalist guy who burned all his bridges. And, you know, I'm going to use this comedian guy who get banned from everywhere because you lot are useless. The, the, you know, the regular man can't relate to you. So I, I just encourage you, man, to keep going and uh, you know, well, you're in my you. prayers regularly. Um, the, the way I feel is is that the the, the it's it's a privilege to have been because I just find this stuff really really interesting and exciting and if I didn't I, I wouldn't be doing it yeah I, mm. I, I, I I've got a very low attention a very short attention span uh, me too but I find this stuff certainly at least as interesting as when I used to study English literature and stuff it, mm. I mean the the Bible. Christianity is just an enormous rabbit hole, and I'm just I'm just frolicking around like a happy bunny, discovering all these and trying to. The, but the intellectual side of things really appeals to me because mm. I think that uh, there's, there's a strain in Christianity which I don't like, which is the the kind of what I call the trust the plan element, where people mm. just sort of want to just let themselves go to Jesus and 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 it, it will take care. Yeah, you know, if, if, if deistic kind of, um, you know, it, it's uh, bypassing the brain a lot of the time. Yes. Um, just, you know, uh, I, uh, what, they're scared of rational inquiry or, 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 you know, honest questions. And I think I think one of the important things is, James, and, and you do this, you embody this well, is you you ask honest questions. You know, if, if you encounter something in Scripture that disturbs you, I've seen you doing this in the Telegram group. Some people say this. You'll ask an honest question, um, and some some of our brothers and our sisters and and you know in Christ, they get upset by that. You know they they can be, you know so, uh, you know because uh, to be fair on them, they have been subjected to years and years of subversives coming to them asking questions. You know it's it's, it's it can often be Satan's way. You know, that's yeah. the initial thing. Did God really say? 
but that it makes it incumbent upon us to to discern the difference between a, a subversive bad actor and an honest questioner. And I think we need to continue to ask honest questions because I think fear, if you bury your questions due to fear, you can end yeah. up with cognitive dissonance. So I, th- I think you've modelled well um, asking questions. That's funny. You, you've you've now frozen. <laughs> Sorry, I, I lost <laughs> but you. But we can end it there anyway because it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. I've really uh, enjoyed it. Thank you. Likewise, likewise. And... Uh, uh, let's Maybe hope it records and, um, and thank you again Nick Mackerson and, and I hope you come back I hope after you've done your, your doctorate you, what are you planning on doing? Um, well it's, it, I've got no idea you know I, I've had uh, thoughts about either lecturing um, you know I've, I've managed to get a, a part time gig doing lecturing in Greek to first year students New Testament students so there, there could be perhaps opportunities in that way or maybe going back into the, the, the past of it. I don't know. I've got no idea. Um, I'll tell I, you I'm who left. does have an idea. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I know. I know. I, I've learned actually not to make too many plans now um, because, um, you know, they tend to go not the way you'd hoped, you know. So, it's uh, yeah, I'm, I, I have an open mind. I'd have yeah, to... well, you know it's going to be, you know it's going to, it's, it's going to work out. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah. Thank you very much. No, it's been thank great. you, James. Uh, thanks for having me. Okay. Bye.